So with that in mind, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, give the screen over to Dr. Sims. Thanks, Dave. Can, um, can you hear and see me okay? You're all good, Steve. Great. All right. I'll get started. So um, thanks. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure today to be able to talk to you about the radiology and classification of acetabular fractures. And then um, uh, after we get done with that, we'll have a little bit uh, of another talk to kind of go through some decision making as well. Um, th these are our goals for today. We hope to be able to review, to review. The, uh, review the pelvic osteology. We'll go through the radiographic landmarks on the acetabulum and how the, the pelvis and how they relate to the acetabulum. We'll try to understand the acetabular fracture uh, classification and why it's important. And then we'll have some talk on decision making as well. So um, I think this is really a very important topic and I would just, uh, I hope that you all had a chance to listen to the video or watch the video that went through this as well. This will be a review if you did. But I think it's important enough where it's worth listening to if you even again. So um, I find that when I have difficulties or challenges in the operating room, it's usually because I didn't spend enough time really thinking about the, the x-rays ahead of time and understanding them well enough. And uh, if you can really spend time and do a good preoperative plan, I think you'll find that it'll make your life a lot easier. So this is just a light shining through a pelvic model and you can see what it looks like. Uh, you can see that there are portions of the pelvis that you can actually see through. You can almost take your finger and poke through some of these areas that are they're, uh, they're only as thick as a couple of millimeters in, in a good portions of the iliac wing and other areas. And this kind of was the basis for what Letronel sort of uh, based his whole theory on. And if you look at it, we can see this, uh, that this pelvis, that one of the main functions of the pelvis is basically to have a place to house the acetabulum so that we can uh, have our legs attached to it and stand up and bear weight. Uh, and Letronel described it as uh, the uh, acetabulum is located in the inverted Y, uh, uh, open arms of an inverted Y, and it's attached to the uh, sacrum through this uh, sciatic buttress, uh, the, which is the large portion that runs uh, in the supraacetabular area back to the, sci to the SI joint. And that led really to the whole concept of the anterior and posterior column, which I think we're all very familiar with, but the uh, anterior column, as we know, includes the superior pubic ramus, the anterior wall, the anterior iliac rim, rim and uh, covers the pelvic brim on the inside portion of the pelvis. The posterior column makes up, uh, is made up of the greater and lesser sciatic notches, the posterior wall, uh, and the ischium and ischial ramus. Um, our understanding of the acetabulum was really based on the three standard radiographic views, and, uh, and it's pretty amazing that basically all of this discipline was done with plain radiographs before we had CT scan. So there really is a lot of uh, information on the plain radiographs and I'd encourage you to spend some time with those. The CT scans are, uh, are, main, are essential now and, and very helpful. And particularly with the 2D and 3D reconstructions, we can even get additional uh, understanding uh, in a more simplistic way. So the three, the three radiographs that we standardly get, as everybody knows, is the AP view. Uh, we can roll the uh, injured side uh, of the opposite side up to get an iliac oblique view. And if we roll the injured side up, we get this obturator oblique view. And this was not by random chance that these views were decided. If you look at the pelvis, we, we understand that the uh, obturator ring is at a 90 degree angle to the main part of the iliac wing, which are both at a 45 degree angle from the true, plane, true anterior plane. So if you roll the patient up for an obturator oblique view, we get a nice frontal view of the obturator ring and we get a tangential view of the iliac wing. And just the corollary of that is if we roll uh, the patient down on that side, we get a nice frontal view of the iliac wing and this tangential view of the obturator ring. So it gives us a, uh, basically an AP and lateral views of the two main portions of the pelvic ring <clears throat> that, that house the acetabulum. Um, it, it is, uh, as we know, important to remember that uh, we really didn't have much of an understanding of what all these lines in the pelvis were in the past, but these have become been defined for us now. Uh, and these lines don't necessarily represent a, an anatomic structure. Instead, it's just a place where the x-ray beam is tangential to a surface for a long enough area that it creates a density and forms a line on the x-rays. Uh, so this was uh, sort of the landmark work that Letronel did, where he basically, you know, where he put the lines, and this is some, one of his one of his pictures from his book, and uh, and really worked out where all of these lines are, so we could understand what 
what they what they were. And this helps us really sit down and draw out our fractures and understand our fractures. And I think that most people are familiar with the six lines, which include the iliopectineal line, which is an anterior column landmark, our ilioischial line, which is a posterior column landmark, our teardrop, which is a complex structure, but uh, usually is displaced or tilted with an anterior column uh, or anterior wall type fracture, the radiographic roof, the anterior rim of the acetabulum, and the posterior rim of the acetabulum. And if you sit down and look at these on every x-ray, you can actually start mapping out your fractures. Uh, and we'll go through each one of these in, in, in a little bit of detail just to make sure that we can uh, understand where they are. So the iliopectineal line uh, is the, the uh, pelvic brim for the anterior three-fourths of the pelvic brim. And in the, in the posterior portion, it's a, an area that's a little bit different. It's an area that's slightly lower than that, as you see here. Um, you can see the dotted line uh, represents the uh, pelvic brim, but the sada line represents the iliopectineal line, which is really an area that's almost in the roof of the sciatic notch, uh, where the x-ray beam is tangential to it in the back portion. So it uh, doesn't necessarily fit to the pelvic brim the entire way down. Um, and again, the importance of this is that you can have a fracture that uh, that exits out through the, uh, you can have a posterior column fracture. I think Dr. Levine will talk more about this in his talk, that exits out very high in the greater sciatic notch uh, that may disrupt the superior part of your iliopectineal line. So while it is an anterior column landmark, and you should think of it that way, it's, it, if you do see an area of disruption very high and it is a posterior column fracture, that it's important to understand where that actually is so that you understand that point. Just to correlate this with our CT findings, uh, this is, uh, shows that the, at the uh, pelvic brim is not exactly the uh, iliopectineal line in the most posterior portion. But as we move forward, this uh, is the, the uh, and, and move down through the pelvis, the pelvic brim that you see here is, is the iliopectineal line. So this is the point that you can look for disruptions on the CT scan to uh, understand where the fracture perforates through that part of the anatomy as we move all the way down to the area of the pubic tubercle. The ilioischial line is, uh, is not a structure at all. It is a basically just an area where the x-ray beam happened to be tangential to the, uh, ex to the uh, uh, pelvis on the quadrilateral surface. Um, and to make this line disappear, what it was done was we basically removed this section of bone that you see on the quadrilateral surface. Uh, and uh, if you remove that, the line goes away. So that shows this is the area. It's important to understand this as well because you certainly can have, and, it, and it's not uncommon as we'll see in a minute, but uh, an area that along this um, quadrilateral surface where the, with an anterior column or anterior wall fracture is common to have one of these flip out and in combination to the quadrilateral surface that would then disrupt the ilioischial line even though it's an anterior fracture. So. Uh, it is important to look at the uh, op at the iliac oblique view and actually see the posterior border of the bone to decide if something actually perforates or exits through the uh, the posterior border of the bone, as you see there. The uh, posterior border of the anterior and posterior walls are the rims of the acetabulum. Uh, the, the posterior rim is a straight line that comes up, as you see here, that's lateral to the anterior rim. The anterior rim always has this little incisura or little indentation and curves and they usually join at the source seal or at the uh, uh, superior portion of the, uh, of the uh, anatomic roof or radiographic roof. Um, if you're having a difficult time finding the anterior wall, it sometimes can be hard to see. This was one without the femoral head in place, which is a little easier to see, but with the femoral head present, it can be difficult. You can follow this little area of the acetabular obturator line, which is basically the roof of the obturator foramen and then it curves gently along and follows the anterior uh, wall. So it gives you a nice way to kind of identify it by finding it, finding it more distally and following it up in a cranial direction. The radiologic roof is just a line that's only about two or three millimeters wide. And again, it's the point where the x-ray beam is tangential to the superior dome of the acetabulum in a very small area. So it does not correspond to the dome itself. So uh, you can't use that as a indication of the dome. And we'll talk about what you can use later, a little, to help you with that a little later on. Uh, the teardrop, again, is a complex structure. It's an area that uh, is along the cotyloid fossa. And then this area that's along the, the superior portion of the pubic ramus, so the roof of that, that comes up onto the quadrilateral surface is the inner aspect of that. These areas are separated uh, and they're not a continuous line. Usually the one that's on the inside is more anterior, more posterior. This typically will be 
disrupted or tilted with an anterior wall or anterior column fracture uh, and not usually involved with the other fracture patterns that you see except for those that involve the anterior column or anterior wall. The iliac oblique view is the other view that we typically get and again it's important to look at the posterior border of the bone. It shows us the anterior rim of the acetabulum and gives us a nice profile of the iliac wing. The iliac oblique view, again, very important that we give us a chance to see where fractures exit out through the uh, posterior border of the bone so we can actually map these out and understand where they'll be on, an, on a pelvic model. It gives us a nice view of the uh, iliac wing where we can see fracture lines that, that traverse it. It can be very difficult to see in detail in other views. I would encourage you just to sit down with the pelvic model uh, and, a, and pictures or diagrams like the one you see here from Letronel's book. Um, and, uh, and start mapping out and thinking about where all these points are. And it can really help you when you start uh, trying to understand the anatomy there. So things are not always exactly where you might think they would be. The operator oblique view uh, is the other 45 degree oblique view that we typically get. And again, it gives us a nice look at the uh, pelvic brim area. It puts the posterior wall out in profile so we can see it nicely. Shows us a nice profile of the operator foramen. Uh, allows us to see the radiological roof in, in, a, in a wider area and gives us uh, just a cross or the, uh, uh, the thin section of the uh, iliac wing that we can see there as well. Likewise, I would just encourage you to sit down and spend some time with the pelvic model and a diagram like this and start drawing and thinking about where all the points are uh, so that you can then do this in the fracture situation to help you with your preoperative planning. The CT scan, again, is an essential portion of the workup in today's world. Uh, it uh, gives us better definition of the fracture patterns and the, uh, and the displacements. And also, it's very nice to show us the marginal impaction that we might see. It can show free incarcerated fragments. It shows us other, other injuries around the, uh, the pelvis, including uh, femoral head injuries like you see with this femoral head fracture. Uh, the 3D uh, surface rendered and volume rendered uh, x-rays have been uh, very helpful in understanding some of the acetabular fractures and the anatomy as well. I um, mean, if you really want to get the most out of these, you probably should spend some time in the radiology department with your x-ray techs and uh, they can uh, basically delete the femoral heads or uh, delete the hemipelvis or the sacrum and you can rotate it however you want to and, and really get a good look at uh, what you actually have there to understand it. Uh, we'll move on a little bit to the classification system, um, and it is based on uh, the plane radiographs. Uh, and, and, and I would encourage you to start with plane radiographs when you're looking at your injuries, look at your CT scans and then your 3D CT scans, and then kind of go back to your plane x-rays and spend some time going back and forth and really mapping out and understanding the fracture. Uh, so Vetronel described, uh, as I think most people know and have heard already, there's, uh, there are five elementary patterns, the posterior wall, the posterior column, the anterior wall, the anterior column and the transverse fracture. Then there are five associated patterns, which are just combinations of two of the uh, elementary patterns, which include the posterior column plus posterior wall, the transverse plus posterior wall, the T-shaped, the anterior plus posterior hemitransverse, and the both column fracture. Uh, we'll go just briefly through these because uh, people will cover these, I think, in detail when they get to their specific fracture types. But just to remind you, posterior wall is a very common fracture. It's about a quarter of the fractures that you'll see in your practice. Uh, it's the only one where the ilioischial and iliopectineal lines are intact. About a third of the time, it'll have a posterior hip dislocation, and uh, you may see femoral head fractures with that as well. So again, just a picture of this. You can see the iliopectineal line intact, the ilioischial line intact. And if all they get is a plain x-ray, it's not, it's not uncommon. I get about two or three times a year a patient show up in my office with a significant posterior wall fracture like this patient you see here who was missed on the initial AP x-ray. But when you get an operator oblique view where you can see it very nicely, it's a very obvious that they have a very big posterior wall fracture. The posterior column uh, is similar to the posterior wall except it detaches the entire posterior column. Uh, it exits through the operator ring and uh, up through the sciatic notch. Uh, it usually is associated with the posterior hip dislocation, which will follow the posterior column segment. And again, the difference between this and a posterior wall is that it involves the obturator ring, where it's the, op the posterior wall won't. Many people will look at an extended posterior wall that, it, that comes uh, from the, uh, um, that, that takes the entire retroastabular surface and comes onto the quadrilateral surface and can and even come up into the sciatic notch and call that a posterior column, which is not. It's only a posterior column if it exits into the operator ring like you see here. 
on, on this particular diagram. And you could also understand that if this price share went very high uh, up into the notch, it might, the, the most superior portion of that could actually disrupt a small part of the superior portion of the iliopectineal line, even though it's a posterior column fracture. This is a classic posterior column a picture with the, the hip dislocated following the posterior column. And again, you can see the iliopectineal line is intact and the ilioischial line uh, clearly disrupted with the femoral head dislocated uh, with the posterior column. Anterior wall fractures uh, are more common in older patients. Uh, we see uh, basically what it is is a segmental fracture of the middle portion of the anterior column. So it's a fracture that exits usually below the anterior inferior spine, uh, takes off the anterior wall and, uh, and, and the anterior column uh, with, a, with a portion of the articular surface. And then we'll usually have this transverse fracture across the bottom portion of the pubic ramus and to separate it away. Uh, again, it's almost always associated with the femoral head dislocation, except for in very low fracture patterns. Uh, and the femoral head, uh, and, and, it was, and it results in this trapezoidal piece of bone that you see here. Um, so again, this just shows that trapezoidal piece of bone that you see in the, in the break that you can see with a segmental break in the, ilio, in the iliopectineal line. So if you see uh, two breaks in the mid portion of the iliopectineal line, it's usually going to be an anterior wall. It could be an anterior wall plus posterior hemitransverse would be your differentiating points there. The anterior column is a separation of the anterior border of the iliac bone. Um, and it is designated by where the fracture actually exits into the uh, into the uh, in the proximal portion, uh, and these can be decided as a call very low, which are the ones that exit usually in the area of the iliopectineal eminence or distal to it. The low, which uh, go through the psoas gutter below the inferior the anterior inferior spine. The intermediate, which are between the anterior inferior spine and the anterior superior spine, and the high fractures, which exit out up high through the iliac uh, uh, crest. And again, with these, what you'll see, as you see here on this view, is this intact ilioischial line. And then we'll see the uh, break that uh, with the disrupted iliopectineal line to break up through the iliac wing. Again, it's not all that uncommon to see some blurring of the ilioischial line in the mid portion if there is comminution on the quadrilateral surface, but basically the line will be intact. And if you look, you'll see that there's this anterior dislocation where the head moves anterior and medial. Uh, you can see here that the um, head is actually medial to the ilioischial line as opposed to the opposite side. Uh, transverse fractures, again, these were included in the elementary fracture patterns, even though they're the only one of the elementary fractures that involve both columns of the acetabulum. And Letronel did this in, in his terms. He said it was because of the purity of the fracture, because there's a single fracture line that actually divides this, as the uh, pelvis into two segments, the iliac segment and the ischiopubic component. Uh, so that you have a single fracture line that divides these in two places. We'll hear more about these, but these are basically subdivided whether in, into the location uh, and orientation of the fracture uh, to whether they're infratectal, juxtatectal, or transtectal. And as we see, the transtectal fractures tend to be more vertical, and they go through the radiologic roof and through the weight-bearing dome of the acetabulum, as you see there. And these are usually the head will subluxate with the uh, ischiopubic segment and move medially, as you see here. Um, the juxtatectal fractures are those that are just below the, uh, the superior weight bearing dome of the acetabulum. And again, these are usually associated with subluxation of the head following the, um, the, the ischiopubic segment. And then the very, or, or then the infratectal fractures, which uh, in, uh, often will have a congruent hip and uh, may be able to be treated without surgery in many instances. So the transverse fracture patterns can disrupt really all of the, the uh, lines except the, radio, except the teardrop, which is usually intact. There'll be a disruption of the iliopectineal and ilioischial lines. There'll be a break through the anterior and posterior rim of the acetabulum. And in these high fractures, let's, such as this one, there'll be a break in the radiologic roof as well. The, the uh, associated fracture patterns, we won't spend uh, in detail on these because the posterior column plus posterior wall and the, and the transverse plus posterior wall are basically just what they sound like. They're a combination of those two fracture patterns that we've already talked about. The T-shaped fracture is, uh, is a transverse fracture that has a vertical limb associated with it that goes through the obturator ring. So we have the, the difference here in the transverse is that the ischiopubic segment is now divided into two pieces. It's divided into the anterior and posterior columns, which are separate in this particular fracture pattern. These are classified by whether the transverse component is 
super tight or, or is juxtatectal, infratectal, uh, or transtectal, and whether the uh, vertical stem exits more anterior, centrally, or posteriorly is how we classify those. Um, again, you can define this by whether you see a break in the obturator ring. Sometimes you can't actually see the break on the initial x-ray, but if you look at a fracture like this one, where you can see that the posterior column is significantly more displaced than the anterior column, then you know that those two are moving separately. So you would know this is not a transverse fracture, but this is a T-shaped fracture instead. And then finally, the last family of fractures is anterior plus posterior hemitransverse fracture. And the, and the both column are very similar fractures. The anterior plus posterior hemitransverse will leave an intact articular segment that is attached to the intact ilium. Um, so the, that means the posterior column fracture exits low enough that there is still some articular surface attached to that intact iliac piece. Uh, often the posterior column will be less displaced and maybe lower as you see here. The both column fracture, the fracture comes out higher uh, and results in this floating acetabulum where there is no portion of the articular surface that's att still attached to the intact ilium um, and, and results in this floating acetabulum. If you explode it out, you can see how that if you try to trace a line from the intact portion to any portion of the articular surface, you would not be able to get there. The anterior and posterior columns are separated from each other as well. And this is the one that we classically see the spur sign on, as you can see here. And that spur sign is basically just a, a representation of the caudal aspect of the intact iliac wing, where we see that protruding down. And because the, uh, the acetabulum and femoral head have uh, migrated medially, it allows us to see that, that spur protruding down. This is not always visible, but, uh, but usually can be seen. So your goal with uh, with spending time with the x-rays and going through them is that you can actually do some preoperative planning and, and think about what you're going to do. So hopefully you had a chance to watch the video that Mark Riley did as well with, uh, with Tanya Ferguson where they went through and showed how you can draw these lines and draw the fracture out on the pelvis. But your goal should be to sit down and draw the uh, fracture on the pelvis. You can then draw where you're going to put your plates and screws. You can think about where you're going to place clamps and, and how you're going to correct your deformity. Uh, and how you're going to uh, address the fracture. And this ought to be the preoperative plan you do for every acetabular fracture uh, ahead of time. Uh, and I think if you spend the time to do this, you'll find that your life will be a lot happier and a lot easier. Uh, just to remind you the difference between the uh, anterior column and posterior hemitransverse and the both column, there can, they can be very similar fractures for the more simple both columns. As you see here, the only difference is that the fracture line is higher for the both, with, for the uh, um, anterior, uh, for the for the, the both column than it is for the anterior plus posterior hemitransverse, so that it can actually leave some articular surface in place on the anterior plus posterior hemitransverse. Just a uh, quick little algorithm. If you have any interest, uh, it, it it won't help you really draw out or classify or understand the fracture, but it'll help you classify it. You basically have uh, four options. One is the ilioischial and iliopectineal lines are intact, and if you have a fracture of the acetabulum, then it will be a posterior wall. If the ilioischial line is intact but the iliopectineal line is broken, then it's gonna be an anterior wall or anterior column, and these can be differentiated uh, fairly easily as we talked about. You can have a situation where the iliopectineal line is, uh, is broken, but the ilioischial line is intact. Um, and these will, um, uh, these will be, this is backwards. So it should be the ilioischial line is broken there, but that would be posterior column or the uh, uh, posterior column plus posterior wall fractures. And then if both of them are disrupted, then we will uh, have a choice of five fractures that involve both columns of the acetabulum. And then you can separate those as you see here by whether there's a break that goes through the iliac wing. If there is, that's a, um, that is a fracture that is um, um, gonna be either an anterior plus posterior hemitransverse or a both column. And if there is not a fracture extending up through the iliac wing, then it's gonna put you in the transverse family of fractures, which you can then differentiate based on what we talked about already. So our goals were to talk about the pelvic osteology uh, and to define the radiologic landmarks. Uh, we wanted to understand the fracture classification and uh, we'll stop there and see if there's any uh, questions and, uh, and then we'll follow up with um, some discussion um, for decision making. Uh, Steve, one of the questions that comes up from time to time is, now that there's software to have volume rendered Judea views, and in fact, a 3D scan, do you really need to have plain film Judea views? And 
put the patient through potentially uh, painful bumping them up and bumping them down. Uh, so w what's your thoughts on that and, and what do you do? Yeah, I think that's a, that's an evolving uh, discipline, I would say. I think that there is some controversy with that. I think there are people that feel very comfortable basing everything on, on just the uh, CT scan and not getting the plain x-rays. Um, and I, there are people that would feel the opposite way. I, I, I tend to be a little bit old school. I like to get the plain x-rays. I do like to get the CT scans and the 3D images as well. And I, and I do spend time looking at the plain x-rays. Uh, the difficulties with the plain x-rays is, as you said, they can be difficult to obtain sometimes, and you can have problems with the quality of them. So that has to be controlled at your institution uh, to make them work well. Uh, but uh, again, the idea is that what we will look at to follow the patient postoperatively, what we'll look at in the operating room to assess our reduction and how well we did will be plain x-rays. Um, and, uh, and the fact that sometimes my initial decision making on whether I'm going to operate or not operate uh, to me, a lot of times it's based on on the plain x-rays uh, and not so much the CT scan. So for, for me, I like to get plain x-rays, but I think there, there are certainly are many people who have moved forward with uh, with just getting the CT images.